So thanks for coming, everybody. It's great to see such a, a good crowd tonight. Um, I'd just like to begin by um, acknowledging the people of the Kulin Nations on whose land we are gathered here today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. So my name's John Whittle. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Information Technology at Monash University. And this is our inaugural um, panel series in what we are now <coughs> calling Monash Tech Talks, or if you prefer, Monash Tech Talks. <laughs> and we're actually um, filming tonight, so if you could make sure that you've silenced any mobile phones um, so that that isn't picked up on the video. Um, the format for the evening is that we're going to have a 45-minute conversation with our two guests, and then we'll throw it open to Q&A from the audience for about 20 minutes after that, and then there'll be an opportunity for further networking and mingling after that. Um, we, we are using Slido tonight, so this gives you an opportunity to ask questions as you go, so you don't have to wait until the end and then forget what it was that you wanted to ask. So if you do want to use Slido, um, follow the instructions on this slide and join the relevant event. And then you can, you can put any kind of burning questions in as you go. We'll look at that at the end, but of course we'll also open it up to the floor given that we physically have people here in person and we will ask questions at that time as well. So great. Um, so the, the, the topic for, for this evening is a very topical topic. Um, it's AI fighting social injustice, or another kind of shorter phrase for that, which I'll use perhaps more commonly tonight, is AI for social good. Now, unless you've been living in a cave for the last few years or so, you will have seen lots of coverage about these two letters, AI, artificial intelligence, in the news. You can barely open newspaper or listen to the radio or go on your favorite internet news stream nowadays without hearing a story about artificial intelligence and how it is changing the world. And it seems that industry is um, accustomed to that as well. So there was a recent survey of Fortune 500 CEOs and 81% of those CEOs said that AI is either very important or extremely important to their industry. Now that's a large number, but the really interesting fact about that statistic is that they were asked that same question a year ago and only 27% of them said that AI was important to their industry. So not only is AI important, but is it gaining in importance in a very, very rapid fashion. Having said that, if you do read the newspapers around AI, you might get scared. Because a lot of what you read in the newspapers is how AI is, is causing problems, um, how AI is um, biased, uh, potentially discriminatory, um, is encroaching upon people's privacy concerns, um, and kind of um, apocalyptic view of what AI futures are going to actually look like. And just to give you three examples of those kinds of things, um, which you may have heard of, so there's a well-known case of AI being used in um, US law courts for parole boards in, that's actually used in many American states, where they're using a predictive algorithm to try and give information to parole boards about which offenders are likely to re-offend. And they use that to make decisions on who to give parole to or not. It was shown in a very famous study that that algorithm that was being used was actually biased against African Americans, so it was actually racially discriminatory. Um, another example, I was actually in China a couple of months ago, um, in Hangzhou province, which has got one of the world's largest producers of security cameras in the world, and they are now using security cameras in schools there with facial recognition algorithms that is pointed at children in classrooms trying to, well, monitor attendance but also detect emotions and try to use that to um, arguably to enhance learning but also the more nefarious side of that to control what the pupils are doing and making sure that they're paying attention in class and so forth. 
And then there's another example from the UK that I, that I always cite as a particularly tragic one. And this is the case of Molly Russell, who was a British teenager who actually committed suicide in 2017. And the, the parents of Molly actually went on a campaign because they argued that Instagram was at least partially responsible for that suicide. Molly was um, prone to self-harm and was on Instagram, spending a lot of her time on Instagram. And because of the way that the algorithms in Instagram work, once you start bringing up pictures of other people self-harming themselves, you get inundated with more and more pictures of people self-harming. And so arguably, Instagram was actually responsible for um, you know, exacerbating that problem. And Instagram has had to respond to that and is now banning um, any images of self-harm on its platforms. So we hear a lot about these examples of AI um, um, doing bad things. That's not what we're actually here to talk about tonight, although that may come up. We're actually here tonight to discuss the positive side of AI, and in particular, how AI can be used as a force for good in the world and can actually promote social justice. And to discuss this topic, we've got two very illustrious guests that I will now introduce to you. So firstly, we are very, very pleased to welcome all the way from California, Professor Milind Tombe, who is currently Professor of Computer Science and Industrial and Systems Engineering at USC, the University of Southern California. And he is also the founding co-director of a center which is the USC Center for Artificial Intelligence in Society, which looks at exactly these kinds of issues. How can you use AI for social good? Um, Milind is about to move from California, though. He preferred a cooler climate, and, and so is moving to Harvard in August, where he will become the Gordon McKay Professor of Computer Science and Director of their Center for Research on Computation and Society. He's a very illustrious guest. Um, he recently won the John McCarthy Award um, from Ichkai for his work in artificial intelligence. Now, that is a very prestigious award. For those that don't know, John McCarthy was really one of the pioneers in the early days of AI and, in fact, invented the term artificial intelligence. So that's a great honor to be awarded such an award. And my research tells me that um, if you look at the number of AAAI papers, which is one of the main conferences in AI, Milind is actually the fourth highest cited scholar in artificial intelligence in the world. You know, uh, you've still got some way to go, obviously, <laughs> if you're only number four. Um, so, so next time we'll, we'll get number three, number two, and number one up here for you to, to hear from. Um, but the, the other thing about Millen that I think is really um, outstanding is that not only is he a successful academic, but he's also translated that academic work into practice. And he's got evidence that that has been well received. He's received meritorious commendations from the United States Coast Guard, from the Los Angeles Airport Police, and from the United States Federal Air Marshal Service. So I'm sure you'll agree that we've got a very um, you know, experienced speaker to talk on this topic tonight. Our other speaker is Monash's own. Um, so Professor Anne Nicholson, who is a professor in the Faculty of Information Technology at Monash University. Um, and she is also Deputy Dean for Research um, in the faculty. Now, she is a leading researcher internationally in the area of artificial intelligence, in particular in, a, in an area called Bayesian Networks, which she might get into later, but which she tells me is the, the dominant technology for probabilistic causal modeling in intelligent systems, if you know what that means. Um, but again, I think Anne is, is, is an example of an academic who's had real impact in the world. Um, her research has led to a spin-off company, and she was also leading a, a project called BARD, which is a very large, multi-million dollar project working with US intelligence analysts trying to use data and artificial intelligence to help intelligence analysts make better decisions in the world. 
And she's also applied this, this technology of Bayesian networks to, to many different domains, including meteorology, epidemiology, medicine, education, and environmental science. And as if that all wasn't enough, she wrote a book in her spare time on Bayesian artificial intelligence, which is one, well recognized as one of the leading books in the field. So those are our two speakers tonight, and I would appreciate it if you could kind of put your hands together to welcome our two speakers to the top. <laughs> So, um, so I'll start with you, Milind, if that's okay. Um, now, I, I recently came across, across a quote from you, Milind, um, where you were talking about your Center for Artificial Intelligence and Society at USC. And it talked about the goals and the mission of that center. And it said the following. It said, our mission is to draw inspiration from the grand challenges of social work the grand challenges of engineering and the, United, and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Based on these goals, our initial projects focus on using AI to end homelessness, fight substance abuse, prevent suicide, improve access to healthcare, develop social responses to global climate change, reduce gang violence, and protect wildlife. That sounds very easy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if you could tell us what kind of successes you have had in, in some of those areas and maybe talk a bit about one or two of these concrete examples which we would term AI for social good. Well, thank you. First of all, uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me. It's really a great honor. Thank you for the very, very kind introduction. Um, and it's really so much fun always uh, to come back to Australia. I grew up in India, in Mumbai, and I grew up listening to cricket commentary uh, and Lily and Thompson, and I was always, you know, so it's Australia is a land of uh, great people of like Lily and Thompson and so on to me. So it's always uh, uh, so much fun to come back here. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a sad story, but uh, LA is uh, home to one of the largest populations of homeless people in the United States. We have 50,000 people who sleep on our streets every night, 6,000 young kids who are homeless um, and sleep on our streets every night. It was shocking to me that there was actually a tent city right next to my university um, that had come up. Now, I've grown up in Mumbai. I've seen, uh, you know, I've seen such... Uh, cities, but this, is, uh, this was shocking. So one of the challenges that we face is uh, HIV prevention. The rates of HIV amongst homeless youth in Los Angeles are more than 10 times the rate of normal housed population. And so one of the ways in which uh, homeless uh, shelters try to spread information is that they, they can't quite communicate this risk to 6,000 homeless kids. So they try to bring in peer leaders, educate them about risks of HIV. So these are messengers, a few of them, educate them, and hope that by word of mouth the message will spread in the social network. So these peer leaders will talk to their friends, and their friends will talk to their friends, and information will spread. So in our work, uh, we identified a different AI-based approach where we could identify better peer leaders, better messengers to bring in to educate them about HIV. So we've run tests in homeless shelters where we bring in youth who are based on the traditional method, which is bring in the most popular youth, and a competing method, which is our AI algorithm that strategically identifies people within the network who would be better messengers. And we've shown that our AI algorithms are far more effective in spreading information about HIV in real life in, in these homeless shelters and actually get rates of HIV testing to be higher in this population. So that's one example. And, and maybe if I could just please follow please. up on that, because it's a very, very interesting example. And I, I, I don't want to get too technical this evening, but... When you say an AI algorithm, can you give us some kind of layperson's idea of 
what that algorithm actually did, how it worked, and why it was so successful? So the way the traditional method worked, which is, uh, you know, obviously you want to find the most popular people and then talk to them about HIV, and then they'll talk to their friends and hope is that that will spread information. The AI algorithm looks at the social network, and it identifies strategically placed youth in the network. And so what it is trying to do is simulate out, using the social network, what would happen if different combinations of youth get selected. So you have to select 12 youth uh, in this network. You could imagine there's 12 among, say, 100. There's lots of combinations of choosing these 12. But the AI algorithm can come in, you know, go through all of the possible combinations and select the best 12 because it can just rapidly work through all these different combinations. For a human being, it would be very difficult to figure out you know, all these different combinations by hand. But, the, but, but just the ability of the AI algorithm to go through all these different combinations and then say, this is the one that seems to be best in terms of being able to spread information. So that's, that's one of yeah, the reasons. So it's looking at the connections on these online platforms well, and then identifying the, kind so of the nexuses and the, the influencers and then using them as your, as your champions to disseminate the information. Right, and one, one quick clarification. So this is not um, a social networks as in Facebook or something. This is just face-to-face -face conversations because these are homeless youth. They don't have access to actual you know, computing platforms and so, so on. So how, if it's face-to-face, -face, then how do you collect that data? That's such an interesting uh, question. So um, social workers have to sit, so this was the first edition of this, was social workers sitting in homeless shelters, looking at who's talking to whom, giving surveys, and then collecting the social network of these youth. So that was the first one. But of course, it's very uh, difficult for the social workers to do all this. And furthermore, our vision is that we would take this and then take it to San Francisco and New York and whatnot. You could imagine if we now say the way for any homeless shelter to adopt this technology, first hire some social workers and, you know, so that, that doesn't work. So can we sample a very small fraction of the network, just 10% of the network, and then identify peer leaders? And so that's one of the things uh, that we've recently done. So instead of having to hire, you know, have the home, uh, social worker sit in the homeless shelter for days trying to map out the social network. Just for a day, I mean, just a very simple survey that the homeless youth have to take. It samples about 10% of the population. And now you have enough information on the basis of which. And again, we tested this algorithm in the field and showed that this one is just as effective as knowing the entire network. Great. So I think that's a really... Um interesting example where you're actually, you know, rather than expecting all this data to be, in a, to, to be in an online social network, you're actually working with what's there already in terms of the kind of physical face-to-face -face interactions. Very interesting. I was quite struck, though, by what you said about noticing what was going on in your own vicinity in LA. Um, because I also know that your center and, and yourself has done work, work across the world, so, so beyond LA. And one of the examples perhaps you can tell us a little bit about is the work that you've done helping rangers um, in African countries, I believe, to stay ahead of poachers and protect uh, wildlife. So uh, we've been working with World Wildlife Fund, WWF, World Wildlife Conservation Society, WCS. The work started in Uganda. What what happens there is um, poachers lay traps or snares, thousands of them every year. And the idea is to maim and kill animals. And so then you can have their tusks and ivory and all those sorts of things. And so this is a big business. There's $6 billion of uh, this illegal wildlife trade that goes on around the world. So can we look at records of where poachers have set, set up these traps or snares? and then predict where these traps may get set in the future and remove them. So that's what we've been doing for the past several years. And we've been successful in predicting, making these maps of where they should go patrol, and being able to remove large numbers of snares and even get poachers arrested. Uh, in Cambodia, uh, we were able to show that our rates of finding snares were 20 times the rates of their earlier method of finding snares. The head of WWF Cambodia was so excited that he said, we should now take it to Malaysia, take it to 
other countries, and so on. So today we are working with uh, WWF, WC, all these uh, different organizations. They have a platform called Smart, and trying to take them across the world. So make, it, make the software available uh, so that it can be taken across the world. Hopefully this will contribute to trying to save a wildlife on a large scale. Excellent, and, and if I'm correct, there is a kind of game theoretic part to this where you've got these two um, adversaries, adversaries, let's say, the, the rangers and the poachers, and each trying to make the best move to achieve their goals, and you've got a mathematical framework that captures that, that you use in the algorithms, is that correct? That's right, so we are trying to, be, we are trying to make predictions about where the adversaries will set up traps. So that's one player in the game. But if we now counter that by always going to the same spots to remove uh, traps and snares and so on, adversaries, may, the poachers will be able to predict where we tend to be in order to remove, and then they'll start moving around. And so we want to be one step ahead of the game and can anticipate where they would move if we put pressure on one side. And kind of game it out and say, okay, you know, this is where they would move to and already be there ahead of them and try to remove them. So that kind of thinking also goes into the algorithm. And that, would, that also makes us unpredictable to them so that they can't quite predict where we will be tomorrow in trying to remove their traps. Uh, and so that's, that's one of the game. Yeah, that's it's, cool. it's interesting to see the progression of AI, which of course started um, a, a lot in the game world with Deep Blue and chess and then with um, AlphaGo and so forth. So to see that that game theoretic um, perspective being actually applied in practice is very interesting. Um, I'll, I'll, mo I'll move to Anne. Um, so Anne, so the Faculty of Information Technology at Monash is also very concerned with technology for social good. So part of the mission statement of the Faculty of IT is actually IT for social good. And there's going to be a new institute at Monash called the Data Futures Institute that's got a key theme around AI for social good. So could you tell us maybe one or two examples from a Monash perspective of what AI for social good means? Um, so thanks, John. It's good to be here also. Uh, so one of the examples I wanted to tell you about is a collaboration that's an ongoing one with the Australian Federal Police that Monash researchers are under, undertaking to use AI algorithms to... Um, automatically identify and classify child exploitation material. That's really um, material that are on computers and on the internet that obviously um, is something from a social perspective that's you know, completely unacceptable and there's lots of laws and, and procedures around that. And the way it works in the legal system is that when there's potentially that um, material there, that people have to go and look at it and classify and say at what level of um, depravity, if you like, that material is. So one is that there's an awful lot of that material and it's very labour intensive and in order to actually keep up and ahead of um, the people that, uh, you know, work in this, uh, you know, exploit children in this area, that they, we want to do it as efficiently as, as possible so that algorithms can do that um, in some ways better than humans can. But more importantly, um, it's really a terrible experience for the individuals that have to be looking at that material day in, day out to do that exploitation. So in terms of um, their mental health and so on. So that's an example where we need to be doing it efficiently at scale but we can also take away that terrible burden from the humans who are currently doing that, that um, task. And so that's one really great example. And there's many elements to that. I mean, there's, there's individual, um, there's, there's additional things about when and where the material was created, because which can help then the investigators um, trace down the sources. There's things around how um, the people using it um, duplicate it and slightly modify it to try and hide it to so to have the AI algorithms realise that it's actually the same material slightly changed and so on. So that's um, one example we have now. Yeah, and, now. and I, think, I think it's a very powerful example. I mean, I, I will always remember my reaction when I was first told mm -hmm. about that, um, that example from our researchers. And I, the, I had this image in my head that was conjured up of um, police officers sitting at a computer kind of 
going through image after image after image to to identify the, these um, kind of pornographic images. Um, but the real problem was not identifying the images, it was they, they would never quite know what was coming up next. And so mm. if something came up, it would be a big shock, and you can imagine straight away how that's going to affect your mental health. Mm. So by using an AI uh, machine learning system, just to be able to kind of flag that, we're not, I think it's interesting because we're not replacing the human in that context, we're mm -hmm. augmenting what the human can do and supporting them in some particular yeah. way. Because we do, this is one of the examples where even though we have a lot of data, we do need to have sort of human input and what we call training or initial classification to get the AI algorithm started. In particular, I mean, it varies across jurisdiction how they even classify the different images, and that's important in the legal case of actually making the case and getting the right penalties and so on. So we had to be working with the domain experts, the people in those legal fields, to capture the right things to go into the AI. And I think that comes up a lot of the time when we're working in these domains, that it's not a matter of us sitting in our back rooms um, just taking our algorithms and grabbing some data and, th and throwing it into our systems and having these great solutions. We have to work with the people that have the real problems and understand the data to best utilise our AI algorithms. Yeah, that's true. And just staying with the mental health and, and uh, for a moment coming back to Millen, because I think, um, so mental health I think is a really interesting um, application area for AI because of course it's such a, a difficult area. Um, you know, um, even just diagnosing these th things in, in using traditional um, psychiatry is, qu is quite difficult, let alone AI doing it. Um, but of course, it's an incredibly important area, and you know, with something like one in six people in the world's population now experiencing some form of severe anxiety. And I know, Milind, that you've also done some, some work in this area around military suicides and trying to identify signals that can actually, again, using the kind of social network and predict, um, you know, indicators of potential suicide cases. Maybe you can tell us about that. So the work uh, right now has focused more on homeless populations and also college kids. Um, it, it's sort of as a first stage towards going to apply them towards uh, suicides in the military, which is clearly a major, major challenge. I should tell you, when we got the grant from the Army Research Office and we advertised that we have this grant and we're going to start working on it, we got really such sad and heart-wrenching messages from parents of, uh, uh, you know, Army veterans and so I mean, you know, people who had committed suicide and parents saying that we want to help you out and so on. It's, it's really uh, something to, you know, something where we can hopefully do something. So the thing that we are looking at right now is a, a program called Gatekeeper Training. Some of you may be very familiar with this idea. So essentially you want to train a few people who are gatekeepers who are looking at the population uh, in their social network and trying to look for signs of suicidality. And again, the question becomes, who do we train as gatekeepers given a large network? You can't train everybody. You can only train a few people. So in all of these uh, projects, essentially the problem is we have limited resources and how to most effectively use them. And so in this case, it's gatekeepers. In the earlier problem, it was peer leaders. In the other thing with the wildlife conservation, it's limited numbers of rangers. So how to most effectively use these uh, limited resources? That's been the focus of our work. Great, excellent. So I think we've got a good sense there of you know, what we mean by AI for social good. Um, what are some very, very concrete examples of AI for social good? The, the next question that I, I want to ask, and I'll, I'll, I'll throw this to Milind, is you know, when we're developing these AI systems, these AI algorithms in this particular context, is, is there something special because it's got a social application, or are the methods that you use basically just the same as if you were working within Google and trying to kind of maximize hit rates to a advert for whatever? I mean, or, you know, what, what, what's different about this? So I see uh, several things that end up being different. We are often working with low resource communities. I mentioned the homeless population in Los Angeles. When we talk about social networks there, it's really the face-to-face -face social network. And then we don't have enough data to figure out what is their true social network. So somehow we have to invent clever techniques to collect data 
because this data is not plentiful. And so essentially this low resource means you have low amounts of data. So rather, I mean, there's a lot of talk of big data and surely we have lots of data in other parts of AI, but when we are working in many of these domains, unfortunately, we have very limited data. It's not well kept, it's, not, it's a lot of uncertainty, it's not clean data. And so one example is indeed, you know, how do you collect a social network of homes? So you have to be very clever in coming up with this limited data and then get the maximum out of that data. So that's one. We're often working, I mean, you know, obviously now there's cloud and cloud computers, so much, uh, you know, computing power is limitless. Not quite so. If you're working with, uh, uh, you know, World, World Wildlife Fund or whatever, and they have these computers and it's in some remote ranger station in, in Uganda, it, you know, you say, well, here's my algorithm. It really, you know, it works splendidly well. You just need this supercomputer to make it work. It doesn't work like that. Often we are working in, with the very vulnerable populations. And so there's a need, the people who work with them, the homeless shelters, um, we, we were also working uh, for tuberculosis prevention in Mumbai, in India, and the health workers. So these are you know, people who want to be sure that what you're doing is not gonna cause harm. And so explain the, you know, the algorithm has to be somehow transparent. It has to be explainable to who we are deploying it with. So there's all these requirements that make the algorithm somewhat different. Fairness becomes a big issue. It shouldn't be the case that uh, you know, suddenly this algorithm works and all the people who got informed about HIV are all men and women are now left out or you know, somehow Hispanic youth are left out of the equation and so forth. All of these uh, questions which are I mean, they are somehow important in other settings as well, but they all come together in some of our domains. And so it causes the research to be somewhat different. Yeah. And uh, also, I very much agree that we have to, you know, go out in the field and we can't, I mean, we shouldn't, uh, for any research, sort of sit in our ivory towers and, and uh, tell others how they should execute it. But here it becomes even more so because we are really working you know, with these life and death situations, sometimes it's, you know, if talking to people about HIV, teaching them about HIV or tuberculosis prevention and so forth. And so we really want to be uh, with them and understand. Uh, and, and so there has, there is all these other uh, social aspects as well that become important. You, you mentioned the, the word explainable there. And of course, the, the idea of explainable AI or AI algorithms that can actually explain why they took certain decisions has is, is become of increasing importance recently. And as many of you here will know, there are certain AI techniques such as deep learning that are not necessarily explainable. Um, does that mean, therefore, that this, this need to be transparent, this need to be explainable means that in an AI for social good context, there are certain kinds of AI algorithms that are not appropriate? Indeed, uh, so we will find that um, for wildlife conservation when we, when we are trying to predict to the rangers, these are the places you should go and you'll find snares. That uh, we have to be able to explain, okay, why did your algorithm come up with this decision? And so, I mean, you could use a, a deep neural net, whatever, but uh, you would still need to explain why it came up with this because they're going to spend their limited resources to trust your algorithm to make these choices. And so we would prefer techniques that are more easily understandable. And so in fact, we had a WCS scientist sit in our lab and we had to explain, okay, this is what the reasoning is. And they said, okay, this, this makes sense, so now we can go ahead and do this. Similarly, in the case of uh, the homeless shelters and so forth. So the first time we came up with, okay, let's not pick the most popular youth. Here are the few youth you should use in order to spread information about HIV. And one of them, that person, that doesn't make any sense because, you know, this person is just not, you know, they're not, and then sometimes high, they're not quite all there. This just doesn't make sense. Um, but we still pick this youth because it's strategically placed in the network and so on. It turned out that uh, this person, when we asked them, came to the training session all sober, all very eager and ready to go. And 
with this person and others, what we've noticed is uh, sometimes there'll be a positive side effect in the sense that they'll actually change their life in, in, you know, in being selected. And they suddenly have found a job, uh, you, know, uh, you know, became sober, all sorts of uh, good things have come about. Yeah, I mean, I, I had a, a, a similar experience myself actually doing this kind of work many years ago, um, working with vulnerable communities and, and, using, and, and developing technology. And we found that actually the benefit wasn't the technology that you'd produced, it was the, the, the kind of power that you gave to these people in these vulnerable communities. They, they felt like finally somebody was listening, somebody was taking their, their opinion very seriously and, and, and really wanted to listen to, to what they were doing. So that's, I, I, I very much... Um, see that case. Um, Anne, you're actually an, an expert in uncertainty. And it, it strikes me that one of the, you know, one of the problems that we may have with AI for social good is, yes, we can say we're working with the World Wildlife Fund or with Homeless, we're coming up with these algorithms, it's going to do these things better and we can do some kind of evaluations to kind of prove that. But at the end of the day, by the very nature of AI, the fact that we're creating intelligence, that can lead to unintended consequences. Mm. So we could put ourselves in a situation where we've got the best of intentions, um, we are trying to do AI for good, but we end up doing AI for evil. So how can we ensure that as a community we're doing AI for good rather than AI for evil? Mm. So we in the AI and machine learning research communities have a fairly well accepted structured practice and methodology as we're developing our models and our methods for if we're using data we use some of the data to build the models but we keep some of it apart and use that to sort of test independently and we have these methodologies that are accepted in order to evaluate and get our materials our work published and so on so on but one of the challenges in what you're referring to John is that when we have a model, it's past our own internal checks and balances and so on, and we deliver it to someone who wants to use it in the real world for predictions and decision-making, that it moves outside of our sphere of influence. And so there's a number of elements to that. One is um, any good AI system embedded in a real world needs to be planned to be with data being continually collected and to be continually um, that data then evaluated against the predictions of the model to see how the model's going, to re what we call re-parameterize the model to adjust it to what the new data is saying. And but that requires sort of additional resources and sort of buy-in and an understanding that it's not there's no AI solution off the shelf that you can just put in place and then forget about it and move on to the next thing. And it takes more money and resources and manpower and so on. So that's a challenge because I think that we haven't got accepted practice around it. People know in um, now they're learning in software engineering that the maintenance aspect is uh, more than the development aspect. And people have always known for buildings and other things that they need to do that. So that's one element. The, the second one, though, is that even though we can be building our models and evaluating them uh, before and during, that we have to make some choices, and often it's data-driven, on which are the key factors around the problem we're trying to solve that we need to even put in the models. So we can check whether we're getting that right and we can tweak them. But if there's things that influence what we're trying to influence that we didn't even know about and we didn't think to measure and we didn't think to evaluate when we're building the models, they're the ones that come back and possibly catch us when we deploy it in the real world. Because we're not even monitoring these other things. And the world's a very complex place. And if two or three levels away, your AI system's having an unintended consequence, that's very hard to detect. And it's very hard to know, whether is it a correlation or a causal thing, or is it just a coincidence? <coughs> so that's a real challenge for our society as we uh, more, you know, we want to adopt these AI methods. I mean, I think what you're saying is that there's a, you know, the, the, there's a level of rigour and care to try and mm -hmm. guard against any unintended consequences. But let me just challenge both of you, mm -hmm. in fact, on, on this point a little bit, because you know, this is a risky business, isn't it? You know, if we're developing AI to sell something on eBay and it goes wrong, it's not a big deal. If we are developing AI to prevent suicides and we get it wrong, 
we've got individual lives at stake. So that, that's a huge responsibility for you as AI for social good researchers. And, and in fact, could lead to significant pressure and stress and potential mental health issues in the researchers themselves who feel the weight of that pressure. So how can the community address that? So from my side, one of the things I um, emphasized, I mean, for myself, for my students and so on, is immersion, to get out of the lab and really immerse ourselves in the domain. To really, uh, so to that end, for example, when we were working with the Coast Guard, we really patrolled with their boats uh, on, in New York and so forth. We really patrolled with the wildlife uh, conservation agencies in different forests, spent time in homeless shelters. The idea is to really try and embed ourselves to understand what is truly going on and to, uh, to the extent that we can understand the immediate impact of what we are about to do. I think it also is important to build interdisciplinary collaborations with social workers, with conservation scientists and so forth, because some of the concerns that they bring to the table, uh, we can really try and understand how we can address them in our algorithms. But maybe I'll ask the question in a different way. I mean, are, there, are there social problems where we absolutely shouldn't apply AI because it's just too risky? Or, or, or is, is everything up for grabs? Well, I guess that I think that we should be looking to apply AI when we know that we're not doing that well or as well as we'd want to be doing with our current methods and with the way we can handle it or resource it now. So that's one thing. That there's got to be a case that we, we want to do better. There's also, um, I think there's, there's two additional elements though. One is we can embed kind of a risk aversion inside our models. You know, uh, when we're trying to do predictions about something significant or a classification, we can factor in the uncertainty in um, what the model thinks is happening and at what level it has to be certain before it actually provides advice that gets acted on in the real world, to be a bit more careful, not just, you don't have to be 51% effectively, but you have to be a lot surer. So that's an internal thing. And then the, the second thing is that when it's in the safety critical areas, and this has been happening in engineering and buildings for a long time, no one builds a nuclear reactor without a lot of fail-safe engineering steps along the way. And I think that we have to think about embedding our AI systems in organisational structures and practices that have those built in as well as just take the software and get the answer and people do something about it. And, and I think another, um, another, uh, another part of this danger, is, if you like, is if, um, if we've got AI for social good researchers developing AI algorithms to do good, on the flip side, these AI algorithms are actually available to those who mm -hmm. have more nefarious purposes in mind. And in fact, you set up a, a game theoretic framework as your previous example. And, and this, 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 therefore, can actually lead to greater security problems and greater safety problems, but even, um, you know, relates to people worrying about privacy and so forth. So I came across a very nice example recently of something called CV Dazzle, which was a fashion company that was developing um, special kind of headwear that was specifically designed so that face detection algorithms in cameras no longer works, which again is setting up that kind of game between these two adversaries. adversaries. So, so are we not in danger of setting up an AI arms race? No, that, that is a, a great question. And so one of the things we do in, in the work we did with the security agencies, one of the ideas is to develop algorithms so that even if they get into the hands of the bad guys, whatever, you know, all the entire code base, whatever, that it still wouldn't benefit them. So the techniques have to be such that, for example, they're not based on secrecy, but more on randomness. Um, so these are the kinds of techniques that we've made available to the LA airport police and so forth. So the basic idea is that we're saying the adversaries get to see all our maneuvers, uh, they, they, they can do complete surveillance, they can take our code, they can take everything. But the whole idea is to be random, uh, so the whole thing is based on randomness. So yeah, they'll know there's a 60% chance that 
you know, the police will take action A, 40% chance that they'll take action B. I have perfect knowledge of the algorithm that generates those probabilities, but I still don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow because it's on all based on randomness. So there are uh, some measures we can take as researchers to develop algorithms that aren't based on keeping things secret, but somehow even if they get exposed, it's not gonna cause harm. But I do think, I mean, we've already seen this in cybersecurity that, you know, you have people trying to do bad things in terms of that, and then you have the software that's trying to detect them and protect against them. And certainly, um, a sort of a, a general area of application of AI is that you get a whole lot of data and you can build a model that represents sort of normal behaviour, and then you, you're interested in the anomalies. And that may, it might be in surveillance and security, but it might be in terms of mental health, when people's behaviour starts moving away from their typical behaviour or so on. So we are already doing things with anomaly detection in our algorithms, and we can start looking at um, anomaly detection um, where we might be detecting the anomaly being AI-driven. And I suspect it'll be quite different from the anomalies that are human behaviour driven in the same way that, you know, computers playing chess and go started doing quite different things. But um, we should be able to, our algorithms will be able to detect patterns and anomalies and biases and things, whether it's human driven or by an AI will need further investigation. Okay, so, so, so kind of last question for me, I think. Mm -hmm. so. Um, so we, we, we've bought into this idea that AI for social good is a, is a good thing. We can be convinced of that. Um, it seems to me to get the rest of the world and the rest of the industry on that boat, there needs to be quite a significant culture change. So where is the industry now in buying into AI for social good and how, what do we have to do to change that culture so that industry, government and others is really using AI as a force for positivity? So I guess uh, it is the case that today we have um, Microsoft has AI for social good division, There's Google has AI for social good, Facebook has AI for social good. So they're all engaged in, these, uh, in this research and applications. Why, uh, you know, there's many theories of why, uh, of why that might be happening. Some of them have clearly gotten into trouble, and so maybe that's a, a way to get out of it. But clearly it's happening. But the economic case for why a company should work with homelessness uh, is, is not clear. What we're saying is that you already are investing some resources whether it's for uh, wildlife conservation or for you know, spreading inf public health messaging and so forth. What AI is giving you the ability is uh, trying to make optimal use of these limited resources. So this is an argument, perhaps for government agencies, that with AI, their own limited resources can be far more effective. And therefore, potentially investing in, in these AI techniques could be of value. And, and presumably, and part of the answer to the question about changing culture is how we educate the future AI technologists. And mm -hmm. I mean, maybe you can say something about how the faculty of IT does that. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I think that um, AI is a subdiscipline of computing and information technology. We've got a real challenge that information technology or computing or computer science has only really been around for, what, 70-odd years as a discipline and mm -hmm. as an emerging profession. And so if you think to other areas of endeavour around, say, medicine, where they've had a Hippocratic Oath for thousands of years, people of engineers have built up a practice over, again, thousands of years of building bridges and buildings and, and the law and so on. So they have professional standards and practice that are embedded in the educational practice in order to become a qualified or a certified or accredited member of that profession that embeds an awareness and that you have to evaluate the standards of, that you're delivering and the broader impact to your users and the society into your professional practice. And in computing and software engineering and AI as a subdiscipline, we do not have that level of professional uh, development and standards, and it's a challenge for us because it's been moving so fast, and how would you keep up? But I think that 
we already um, in, are trying to embed and do embed in our core teaching things around ethics and privacy and these other elements. But until our society and industry require people working in those fields signing off on the ALI and so on to have that accreditation, then we're not getting there. And the second thing is, as well as, I think that we need to stop seeing AI and computer science as something that's um, sitting off here over on the side. We need to have more of our students combining their computing and AI with, um, a, say, in double degrees or breadth elements of their degrees, mm -hmm. so that their people and people who are working in those other areas who might be using AI systems have that better understanding mm -hmm. as well. So I think we need to work on both those yeah. aspects. Culture change is always hard, as we know. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are some, some, some po signs that this actually can change, mm -hmm. though. I mean, I saw in the news this morning that Facebook has had its annual developer conference, and in a, in a different area, not AI, but in data privacy, which is, of course, very related. Um, Mark Zuckerberg is now quoted as saying, the future is private which is quite a turnaround from what he said back in 2010 <laughs> when he said that uh, privacy is no longer the social norm. <laughs> so, you know, it may take 10 years, but the cultures can change with these, these, these large technology companies. I think at that point, what we're gonna do is to open it up for Q&A to the audience. Um, so you can, of course, post your questions on Slido, but you are here. So you can also do it the old-fashioned way and raise your hand and we will call upon you. And we have a very quick hand go up in the front here. So are we we'll doing go mics? to you first. And I believe there are roving mics got a mic. coming. Is that correct? <coughs> so your hand was so that quick. Was you, very loud yeah, well, you... you it, oh, it's coming. It's coming. Your, your hand was so quick that it was quicker than the mics. Um, and later doing some IT and stuff and, you know, consuming news. Uh, you're always, always hearing about older people who struggle to give up their cars and things. One of the things that I think AI can do is to help people to make that decision. If we, as a society, can provide transportation in a fair and reasonable way, such as, for instance, a paper that would call a connecting vehicle to take you to the local hub so that you can then manage everything. Because social isolation, medical needs, everything is so costly. I know that there's half price taxi vouchers if you qualify, but it's a burden if all of that goes on the medical needs. So I think we need to work in that field too. Uh, well, in fact, some of our AI researchers are working on um, helping the elderly, you know, manage that stage of life. Um, one element is trying to help support elderly people in the homes and to be safe and have their needs met, but without being too intrusive. You know, for example, we can now monitor houses and see, uh, basically detect falls and s see if there's lack of movement, if there wasn't normally and so on, which is something that AI systems, you know, it's part of their bread and butter. But the, the challenge for us is how do you, embed that into a living environment that people find acceptable. And that is the really tricky thing. But I totally agree with you about the use of technology in general and AI in particular to best use it in the most efficient ways to get the best value for the money, for the limited resources we've got. Not only just scheduling the, the pickups and things, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to never driving again in a few years time, because mm -hmm. I'm... Um, as long as they're, they're safe and so on. But th th those um, uh, things for getting people out and when they are in their homes, having them connected and having them feel like they're connected um, as well is really important. I think I'm going to go to this yeah. question on Slido that's in front of us because I think it's a really interesting one. Uh, I'll, I'll maybe rephrase it in a more pithy way though. Um, AI for social good, but who defines good? Which, which moral framework, which ethical framework, of course, that can be different in different contexts, different countries. So, so who decides what's good and what's not? That's a, that's a really difficult question. And 
Uh, I've had, uh, you know, journalists uh, sort of raise this question, and then um, I think it was in The Verge or something where, uh, you know, they've written this article about uh, predictive policing and so on and so forth, and somehow they came to me and they asked me about the work that was somehow connected to that. And then, you know, I emphasize, look, you know, we are really uh, a center for AI for social good. And our job is to really embed ourselves in the community to understand the needs of the vulnerable population and then try and try and develop decision aids that would assist caregivers, health workers, social workers, and so forth to assist them. So, so that's what we are really trying to do. So this journalist listened to us, and in the final quote that appeared, they said, you know, Professor Thomas, is, it's all center for social good, and it's all connected. But I wonder whose good is he talking about, and so on. So, I, I mean, Generalists. <laughs> so it's, uh, it is a very uh, interesting and important question. And I guess. Yeah. So I, I don't think we're anywhere near the AI system itself learning what is good or best for whatever. I don't think that we're anywhere near that level. So at the moment, when we build our AI systems, they're, they're the, the, the good AI systems in the sense that we're trying to build, what we have to do is work with the right um, stakeholders to capture their requirements, if you like, or their preferences and their utilities, we call it in a, in a theoretical sense. But the, the difficulty we've had, and I'm going to give a practical example, is that when there's an element of the system when you're trying to trade off what you do versus the probability of a good outcome, you can put in the cost in a money cost. People understand the cost of a medical treatment and, the, and, and, and they might understand you know, policing costs and some other things. But there's other outcomes that we're trying to change you know, by our AI systems and they might be the quality of life of a person or um, they might be the environmental um, value of having some species that are otherwise going to go extinct not go extinct. And they're very hard to put a money cost on. And I've actually been working with building these sort of Bayesian network systems. There was one example where we were modelling for the Western Grasslands Reserve. It's being developed north of Werribee, um, to the west of Melbourne, to replace some of the grasslands that have been taken away by the spread of Melbourne with um, population expansion. And we were building these models to do what-if scenarios about how best to get these grasslands back into th this environmental place. And our scientists were great. They knew and they understood about um, the cost of burning and we uh, getting rid of weeds and reseeding grasses and all the rest of it. But in order to get the AI system to do the what if, we had to put an environmental value on which species of grass back in at what time frame. And we couldn't get them to give us any numbers that would be on the same scale as the money costs. So we ended up building an AI system that let them do these what-if scenarios where for every scenario of different um, actions they could take, we actually had two outputs over 20 years. One would be the money cost and the other would be this positive or negative environmental value at the end on a completely made-up scale. And they didn't have to put them on, but at least they could see the trade-off for different scenarios about what sent money down, that was good, and what sent environmental value up, even though they weren't necessarily on the same scale because we couldn't get them to be comfortable about merging them. And that was a challenge. Questions from the floor? Uh, lots of hands. Uh, maybe this gentleman here. <clears throat> Uh, I assume, like, with the um, project to classify and take job of the project team, like, developing that software had to view uh, content, so, like, I was wondering how that affected the project team, like, the developers. I'm wondering if I should hand this over to the person in the audience who was the researcher. But um, not, not the, the researchers, um, but... Uh, I believe that they had to have some training data, is that right, Campbell? Yeah, so people, 
have already looked as part of real cases at certain sorts of materials. So we didn't have to do extra looking at things for this project. We were utilising resources that are already been used and, and data that had already been collected in the past. So that meant we weren't um, you know, having a big negative in order to do the research. It was utilising what had already been done already. But uh, and, and with the aim of in the future needing to have less of that. So that's how we can justify that it's ethical research, that our methodology is ethical. There's a question right here. Hi, I'm one of those people who are scared with AI. And I have to say thank you, you such a thing. I have a question for Professor Kim Kambi. Um, I, I read about the you know, article for AI turning poachers into prey. And um, it says there that uh, the USC computer scientists use um, proprietary labeling tool to tag 180,000 people and animals. So are you using microchips there or to identify if it's human or uh, so animals? Or if you're using um, images to measure the height So this is a different project uh, than the one that I described. Here, this was a separate project where we were flying drones. Yeah, this is in Botswana in South Africa. And the drones are taking infrared images, video. The original idea was that there would be a human being in a van where these video is being transmitted, looking at this infrared video at night for many, many hours and trying to spot poachers and animals to call in a ranger to say, hey, you know, this is... Uh, poachers on. But of course, it's very difficult for a human being to be watching these videos for hours on end. And so we developed this uh, AI algorithm that would automatically try to detect animals and poachers and alert a human being to say, hey, you know, somebody's... Now, how do we know it's a poacher? Because uh, this is restricted grounds. No human being is supposed to be there. And so if we see a human being there, then something illegal is happening. So that's, that's the way it worked. So right now, uh, could it be fooled? Well, it's doing infrared if these people are very, very smart and they figure out all of this infrared things and so forth and they somehow, you know, wrap, uh, put some cold body or something. Yeah, it could be fooled. But fortunately, we are not there yet. Uh, so right now, the drones can fly and spot poachers and we are able to detect them. And so this is something that, um, uh, there's, there's lots of very interesting things going on there. Uh, one of the things that happens is um, sometimes you try to call a ranger, but the ranger's not, there's not enough rangers. So what they do is they uh, fly the drone and turn on the light to try to deceive the poacher that a ranger is coming when there is no ranger. They just turn on the light. But of course, if you keep doing it repeatedly, Poachers will figure out that this is deception, <coughs> right? That uh, any time there's no ranger, the lights come on, and so they'll <laughs> ignore it. So can we strategically deceive poachers by lying to them? So sometimes turning on lights, sometimes turning not turning on lights to kind of keep them off balance about what really is going on. Lots of very, very interesting things to be done to uh, try to protect endangered wildlife. I'm going to go, I've got two more questions, one from the floor and one from uh, Slido. So maybe the, the lady stood over here, the final question. Thought there'll be time to ask them during the networking afterwards. Um, hi, this is maybe just more like a pragmatic question, but in a lot of the social injustice and racism that we see around the world, there's this kind of like Actually, developing that technology, and so how do you manage the, the interaction between 
interaction between, like, hey, you are creating technology, let's say, to, um, you know, to kind of help these social injustices get worse, like the policing one, for example, which was very, very directly related, for example, to homelessness. And, and like, I'm doing the opposite. It seems a bit like, in a secondary level, a bit of like an AI file. Yeah. So how do you manage that in your professional scope of things? I'm happy to take it. Oh, you want to go first? That's yeah. all I got to So, you. no, I, th I think this is a really very, very important question. One of the things that is extremely important as we develop these uh, techniques is an interdisciplinary partnership that we must develop. So I hang out a lot more with the social work colleagues. I, I like going to the School of Social Work. I feel like it's, you know, the people there here in the computer science of a people a startup and this and that and who, you know who got how much funding and uh, and all of that and you go over there and it's all about social injustice and how, what's and it's so refreshing and different uh, or the school of public health and and you know i mean they they're talking about completely different kinds of issues and so i i feel that that interdisciplinary partnership, if we just as AI researchers sort of say, look, we know what is the, the, the right solution for home. The right answer is a chatbot. That's what the homeless youth need uh, without ever talk. I mean, you know, and then you got to go to our social work colleagues and say, no, that's not, that's not what's needed. They're, they don't need a chatbot companion. There's a lot of, uh, so, I mean, I, I think, the right answer there is that we as AI researchers sitting in our labs, you know, can't find solutions for remote communities in Cambodia or Uganda and say we know better with our AI techniques that this is the solution. Ultimately, we are trying to, at least in our work, develop decision aids that assist humans in their work with other humans. So it's, a, it's really trying to amplify uh, the abilities of human beings trying to work with other human beings rather than coming in and saying, we know better, let's replace what's going on with this AI techniques. Well, I want to slightly give a different perspective. I guess maybe I'm a bit more pragmatic. And even though I've been talking about the social good applications that I've been, you know, uh, really passionate about working on, the techniques that I use, the particular methods and the um, algorithms and so on can be applied to helping mm. banks uh, manage their investments better, helping people target their advertising or design their um, websites better. And I'm actually fairly pragmatic if, if there's sort of these fairly, um, I don't think of these as really negative, I think of them as supporting businesses, um, make money, um, satisfy their customers, and if we can develop the techniques with their funding because they'll make money out of it, and I can take the same algorithms and some of the same software and apply it in these different areas with a few different mm -hmm. elements, then I'm happy to do that because it's very hard to get research funding um, in these areas that we want to be. So if we can leverage the techniques and the tools that people are willing to fund into these other areas, I think that's a bonus. I was going to ask uh, oh. one of the questions from Slido, but mm. the question you asked was exactly the one that I was oh. going to pick from Slido. So instead, I will ask the final question of my own. Sorry, guys. Um, and, and maybe I'll ask if you could um, just give us a, each a brief answer to this question, and it's really more of a personal question. So you're both computer scientists, and yet here you are talking about social justice, working with social workers and so forth. What made you be interested in that? You know, was there a particular event in your life that changed you from being a kind of bog standard computer scientist to somebody that cared about these things? I think we all care. Uh, you know, we, we all want, uh, I mean, when we held the AI for Social Good event for undergraduate students, you know, 300, 400 students show up. So there's sort of a deep desire, I feel, uh, to really try and use our technology for good. And I was fortunate enough that I found a friend in the School of Social Work who I could, you know, I could really get along with. And suddenly it just seemed like, wow, this is really a great friendship that we can have. So that was my turning. Great answer. And Anne? So, uh I don't, I think most people have different facets to themselves and their interests. I ended up being a computer scientist possibly because I'm a little bit nerdy but a problem solver and I like um, intellectual challenges, if you like, and, you know, 
uh, computing and the opportunities it offered at the time that I was going through just seemed new and exciting. But like many people, you know, we live in the real world, we deal with our lives and our families and we see what's happening in our community and our politics. And even though we're academics or computer scientists, we're embedded in that broader community. And I think, especially maybe as we all get older, you know, we want to make a difference. We want to leave a really positive legacy. As an educator, I'm also happy to have done that through my teaching. But in terms of my research, I, I found it very satisfying that my tools and algorithms, as well as you know, getting publications and citations, which we have to care about in academia, that people are using them and that I can see that they're in these areas that um, I feel are really important and I'm happy to make a difference. I think that's a great note to end on. And so just before we thank our speakers, um, let me do a couple of things. First of all, invite you to stay around afterwards. There will be, the bar will be open and canapes will be coming out. Please, the speakers will uh, stay for that networking. Uh, please do use the opportunity to ask the questions that you couldn't ask um, during the uh, formal part of the evening. Um, we would um, like, if you uh, don't mind, to fill in our feedback form on this event so we can help improve these events in the future. And we've got a very um, wonderful prize that will be drawn <laughs> at 8 o'clock from the people that are filled in that feedback form. <laughs> and this is only those that fill in the feedback form. And this is a, a personal tour of our SensiLab facility at Monash Caulfield. Uh, SensiLab is our state-of-the-art um, augmented reality, human-centered AI, um, virtual reality, <coughs> designer, makerspace, lab that, let, let me tell you, if you haven't seen it, um, it's worth you filling in the feedback form <laughs> um, because it's, it's really quite something. You know, it's a multi-million dollar investment and it'll give you a flavor of what the technologies of the future are going to look like. And then finally, I'm going to make a shameless plug on my own behalf, to, just to let you know that Monash um, is starting a new institute called Monash Data Futures that will be um, really trying to be a leading centre in Australia and internationally on AI for social good, um, looking at the role that AI and more generally big data can play in three key themes, health sciences, um, governance and policy and sustainability. So do look out for various activities that will start kicking off in the next year around that. But we take this, this idea of AI for social good here very, very seriously. As I know, does Milland both at USC and in his new role at Harvard. And we're hoping to get some collaborations going with Harvard as well. So with that, I'd just like you to put your hands together and give a really rousing applause. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you.